Well, thank you everybody for coming this morning. Um, I was worried about the snow getting in the way, but it seems somebody had the right connection, so thank you, whoever you are. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jody Underwood. I'm the president of the School District Governance Association. Um, the, so if you don't know the organization, um, we have a number of non-members here today, as well as members, which I'm really thrilled about. Um, so the mission of the SDGA is to help school board members and budget committee members discover their powers um, to, to keep school district governance transparent and accountable with a focus on educating students. And we do have a strong focus on that. Um, so again, I welcome old members. Reminder that it is a new year and happy new year to everybody. And it's time to renew your membership if they didn't get you at the registration desk. Um, the, the good news is, I mean, we're, we're, we're getting up to speed technologically in this organization. Our website, our new and improved website, is going to be uh, released any day now, right, Skip? Right, Skip? Yeah, he's like, yeah, whatever, Jody. <laughs> you're on. Website, yeah. It doesn't matter, it's good. Keep doing what you're doing. You're doing great. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and we have online payment for both seminars and for registration. It's gonna, again, start really, really soon. So if you didn't bring money today, um, I, I will be posting soon. It'll be in the next newsletter that this is available online. Make it easy for everybody to give us money. Um, and it's not a lot of money, and we appreciate everything you do give us. Um, so I do welcome the new people here, and there are some brochures on the table about the SDGA. Please take one, and there's a membership application in there. If you like what you see today, please join us and help us do more of this. Um, and I would like to thank everybody who helped uh, put this and all the seminars that we do together. Um, and I hope I don't miss anybody. Uh, thank you to Skip for recording, to Jan and Don for registration. I believe they're still out there. Hopefully they'll come in soon. Uh, Pam for, for food, uh, although she wasn't feeling well, so she didn't stay and she brought food anyway. Um, and for food, we, we would love if you offered donations for it to help offset the costs. We really run on a shoestring budget. And um, Diane for helping with all these back end stuff, so appreciate that. Uh, and welcome back, Jorge. We are so glad to see you. So in today's seminar, so I'm gonna talk about that now, we'll do a little segue. In, so I do education research for my day job. Um, I work on technology for learning and assessment. Um, and in my circle of education researchers, people talk about teaching students 21st century skills. And I always wonder what they mean by that. Like, what is it you need to learn now that you didn't need to learn before? It's thinking, critical thinking, and so on. Um, and so, you know, is it any different from what we needed in the past? So there's new technology, but it's not always used well, and so on. So how can we train anyone for what's coming? How do we know what's coming? And they act like they know what they're talking about. So I invited our two speakers today who I know to be good and inspiring thinkers to talk to us about the future of schooling. So let me give you an introduction, well, the agenda. Here's what you're gonna to expect to see today. So first, uh, Ian Underwood will speak. Um, and I mean, we're already 9.15, we have two speakers. Uh, and we have the room until noon, so I, th I think it's gonna work out fine. So even though we're getting a little bit of a late start. After Ian speaks, um, we're gonna have a, a quick break, and then I'm gonna invite committee SDGA committee members to come up and talk about what their committees do, um, and try to take names to get involved in your particular committees. Um, then Frank Edelblue will speak, and we'll take another break after that. Um, which time I'm gonna invite other organizations who wants to make a plug for their organization that's somewhat related to school um, and, and so on. Um, in, in the meantime, we'll end, and then the third hour, whatever hour that turns out to be, um, we'll open up the floor to questions for the speakers. So during their talks, ask clarification questions. They're both more than willing to accept them. It helps engage them too, makes them more interested if they see you're interested. 
Um, but if you have any deeper questions that you want to get into, there's a pad, a blue pad on each of the tables. Grab some sheets of paper and, and write down your questions. And what I'd like to do is collect those questions and I'll choose some top ones that I think are um, a way to kick off that third hour to present to both speakers what they might want to respond to. Um, and then we'll open the floor to everybody um, and ask anything you want. If I don't get to your question, nothing personal, feel free to ask it after. Um, and let's see. So that that's my um, agenda. And then just some housekeeping in case you don't know. I mean, I've already said, help yourself to food, feel free to get up and so on. There are two bathrooms available. Uh, there, one is right outside to the right of this door, and one is around the corner past that. So there are two. Um, and with that, I am going to introduce our first speaker. So he hasn't heard this yet. So yeah, <laughs> he's not hearing it now? and he's not hearing it now. This is normal. We're married, you know. <laughs> So with degrees in math and the learning sciences, Ian Underwood has been a planetary scientist and artificial intelligence researcher for NASA and the director of the renowned Ask Dr. Math service where he trained teachers and students how to think about math. He's a co-founder of Bardo Farm and Shaolin Rifle Works and is treasurer of ethics and economics education of New England. He's also a popular speaker at liberty-oriented events. Ian reads more than any 10 people I know in wide-ranging subjects, and he raises perspectives that most people have not been exposed to. Someone I know, who's in this room, has said that Ian's ideas give him a headache, but in a good way, the, the man wildly raising his hand. <laughs> you may not agree with everything he says, but I welcome you to keep an open mind, and if you don't agree with him, to challenge him. I give you Ian Underwood. Well, that's a lot to live up to. Um, so, you got it. So, I'm going to start by talking about uh, just the future in general, right? Going back to the future. Um, and everybody knows what the future looks like because you see it in movies all the time, right? A director <laughs> can just show you something that we don't know how to do, like people flying around in jetpacks or cars or. People, you know, oh, we, we hook a machine up to your eye and we suck out all your memories and put them on a disc. And we look at that and we go, hey, we don't know how to do that, but we'd like to. And so that's the future. The future is basically things that we don't know how to do yet. And some of them we'll never be able to do, perhaps, like uh, faster than light travel. Some of them, maybe we will. And to illustrate that, I mean, so, so if you want to write a fiction story, about the future, here's what you do. You just ask one of these questions. What if we were able to blank? Or what if we no longer had to blank? And then you go from there and you answer that question and you get a novel or a movie or a short story or whatever. Um, and I want to just look at the history, the, the future. We're going to go back in the past and look at the future of communication just very quickly because I want to make this point. So as long as there's been language, people have been able to communicate with each other. But there were constraints, there were obstacles, right? And the future is about removing obstacles. So the obstacles were you had to be near each other, right? And you had to rely on things like memory. So I've, I tell you something and you walk away and you remember it differently or I didn't, wasn't clear, then you get this sort of loss of meaning and eventually we discover writing. And now distance is less of a problem. I can communicate with somebody who's not nearby I can communicate with people who are dead because they've written stuff that I can read. I can communicate with people who aren't yet born because I can write something down. And if I write something down and it doesn't change, then it's not so dependent on memory. I don't have people running around misquoting me or changing what I've said, right? So mutation, distance, those are less of a problem. Some obstacles have been removed and then we get movable printing, right? Where now, group size is less of a problem. It used to be like, I've got a book, I'd like to make a copy of it, I have to write it out, or hire some monks to do it, or whatever. And that's very expensive, right? And it's hard to get lots of copies, and so with movable print, suddenly, having written it, having typeset it, I can make as many copies as I physically want to. But still, okay, now I've got a bunch of copies, how do I get them to people, right? And so you don't think of ships, trains, planes, things like that as communications devices, but they really were. Because suddenly now Thomas Jefferson can go, oh, 
I heard in a letter that somebody wrote something and he can send to Paris and say, I need a copy of that, and they can bring it. Or he goes over to Ben Franklin and says, would you, you know, publish this? So, once again, at every step we're seeing obstacles removed. Things that used to be hard become easy. So then you go another step, you invent the telegraph, the telephone, where now you have communication at a distance. It's even less of a problem, and you don't really need a physical medium. I can talk to you. I can send a message without having to write it on paper, or publish it, or send it out. And then you get radio and television, where now there's no physical connection. I don't even have to run a cable from where I am to where you are. You can be on an island. You could be on the moon, and I can talk to you, okay? So again, at each step, so then we get copiers, right? And copiers, uh, you think, they, you take them for granted, but there's a huge step forward there. It used to be, let's say I had a book, and I wanted you to have the book. I had to give you my book, and then I don't have it. But with copying technology, and this is back to everybody remembers Mimeos, right, from, from their high schools, and just carbon paper, even. The fact is, now you can give somebody something and keep it, okay? And then you go to digital media, where that becomes even easier, and you don't have the loss, because everybody has seen a copy where somebody got something, photocopied it, and then somebody photocopied that copy, and, and that copy, and that copy, and by the end, you're like, you can barely read anything, right? Or, there, well, there's a picture of something there. I'm not, is, that, is that a dog? Is it a muffin? I don't know. So that goes away, and storage is less of a problem, right? If I got a, a thousand books, my house at home is full of books. And if I actually could get them in the form I really want digitally, I could live out of a suitcase, right? So that becomes less of a problem. And then we go to networks, right? And now you have instant transmission. You have instant updates where Wikipedia, right? Somebody, you find out something's wrong or something happens, somebody gets elected, somebody dies, boom, it's done in five minutes and everybody can get it. And you have continuous updates, right? And you have essentially infinite storage at this point and your location is completely irrelevant. If you want to know something, you want to find out something that doesn't, matter where you are. So, yeah, you could, sure. Um, so what comes next, right? And thinking about the future, what comes next, whatever it is, will come from people asking those two questions, right? What if we were able to blank? And what if we no longer had to blank, right? So. What are obstacles that stand between us and things we want to do? Like, what if we were able to speak in real time to people in other languages, right? We had a babble fish we could put in our ear. What if we could do that? Well, maybe we'll be able to at some point. What if we could transmit physical objects like we do messages? And you think, well, teleportation, Star Trek, but it's like, what about 3D printing? I give you an idea and the thing shows up somewhere else, right? So those ideas, those are obstacles that may or may not be hard obstacles. Um, what if we were able to record somebody's memories, right? How much difference would that make in terms of like, right now, somebody, you live for 70 years and you've got all this stuff in your head and it's like an ice sculpture and you die and it's gone. Whatever you didn't write down or tell to somebody, well, what if that wasn't the case? What if we could actually record what people did? What if we no longer had to work? What if we no longer had to die? Okay, so those are obstacles and we can remove those and the future is about removing those obstacles. So, the thing about obstacles is, some of them are put there by the world, okay? Um, th those are things like the fact that two things can't be in the same place at the same time. Um, or that you can't travel past certain speeds or things have mass and it's just okay, things have mass and you have to deal with that. Um, on the other hand, and some of those things can be made less relevant by technology, some obstacles we put in our own way. Okay, the, the world isn't doing this, we're doing it. And when we do this for fun, we call it a game. And for those of you who are involved in education and hear about this trend towards gamifying things, oh, let's make that into a game. Interestingly, game is a word that in philosophy was used for many years as an example of something you just really couldn't come up with a good definition with. And then recently, some guy wrote a book and came up with what I think is actually the right definition for game, and it's just this. It's a situation, a game is a situation where you put a voluntary obstacle in between yourself and some goal. It doesn't necessarily involve scoring or keeping track of something. It's just, I'm going to do, there's something I'm going to do, and I'm going to make it hard on myself because I want to. And the reason I mention this is because if you have people trying to make something into a game, and that, those obstacles are not obstacles that the students chose, it's not a game. It's a chore, it's a test, 
It's no different, apart from being flashier, it is no different than all the others here. Fill out this worksheet. Oh, play this game. They're the same. If the kid didn't choose the obstacles, it's not a game. Anyway, so games are a situation where we put obstacles in our way. Um, and sometimes we do this out of tradition. Right? We, when we do this out of habit, just because we're used to doing it, we, we call that a tradition as opposed to a game where we just do something because it's what we know how to do. And sometimes we call it politics, right? We just, this is what we're doing. It's, it's what we know how to do. We'll just keep doing it. So wherever these obstacles come from, it's a really fundamental error and one that people make all the time. Uh, to think that they have an obstacle of one kind and it's really a different kind. And the, for our purposes today, the most salient example of that is when you mistake tradition for necessity. And there's a joke that I love that captures this. So this guy walks into his uh, kitchen just in time to see his wife cut the end off a roast and throw it away. And he's like, honey, why'd you do that? And she says, I don't know, that's what my mom always did. That's how you cook a roast. And they say, well, let's call her up and find out. So they call up the they say, Mom, why'd you always cut the end off the roast? She's like, I don't know, that's what my mom always did. That's how you cook a roast. And so they call up Grandma and say, Grandma, why'd you cut the end off the roast? And she's like, well, I used to cut the end off the roast because my roaster was too small. Okay? So you have generations, you have a whole family tree thinking this is how you cook a roast. You cut the end off, you throw it away, you put it in the oven, right? But that's not, you know, what, what they're trying to do. And we see sort of an example of this right now in discussions of things like stabilization grants. So there was a recent presentation on WMUR where some children were brought forth and the message that they were trying to give you was essentially is if we had more money, we wouldn't have to pretend that things had changed. Okay, that is the, the fundamental idea behind a stabilization grant. We can pretend that things haven't changed, that we don't have different problems, that our roaster is the same size it's always been. Anyways, I'll be referring to that joke a lot. Um, so there's an author, William Gibson, and one of the things he likes to say is, the future's here already. It's just not very evenly distributed, right? So some guys, their concern today is winning a jetpack race, okay? Other people, their concern is being able to get clean water. Okay, And there's no technical or conceptual obstacle to getting those people clean water. It's a cultural or political thing. It is The, the reason they don't have water is because somebody is putting an obstacle in their way. It's not the world. It's somebody. Um, and so the take home message from that is a lot of times getting into the future doesn't mean you have to even invent something because stuff's being invented all the time. It doesn't mean you have to force something to go in and say we shall do this. A lot of times it just means letting something happen. It's more about getting out of the way than about forcing something to happen. So if we look back over that history of communication um, and we compare it to what happens in a typical classroom, what's surprising to me is how hard we have worked to make schools into future-free zones. Okay, you look at all the things that we can do outside of a school using networks, communicating with people, talking asynchronously, right? You can do all this stuff, and then as soon as you go to school, you can't do any of those things because you have to sit in a room like this and some guy talks to you, and basically we're going back, you know, we still have some technology, but in terms of how we're using it, we're really back in the Stone Age. We had a friend, when we lived in Nashville, we had uh, some uh, kids who lived across the street that we'd hang out with, and they were homeschooled, and one day, one of the kids, said to us, we were talking about Age what... seven. Right. He was six, I think. Six. Six or seven. And what he said to us was, he said, you know, I don't understand how kids can learn in classrooms because they can't pause or rewind. And it's like, he's right. You know, why can't we do those things? Um, so anyways, uh, you know, here's the thing I, I say all the time, right? Any kid with a laptop or a smartphone and an internet connection, has instantaneous access to anything that anybody has ever known, right? He's a click away. And it, more importantly, for the purposes of schooling, he, he has thousands of people lined up competing to try to teach him anything he wants to know, often for free, right? You want to learn how to play the ukulele? YouTube. You want to learn, you know, linear algebra? MIT, Stanford, Berkeley, they have their courses online, right? The teaching company for 69 bucks, you can get the best teacher in the world teaching you any subject that you want to learn. 
And here's the thing, as I said, he has access to all that stuff except when he's in school. So we actually send the kid to the place where he's supposed to be learning and we take away all the tools that society's developed for him to use for learning. So here's, here's the thing I want you to keep in mind. It might be the case that all we need to do to move schools into the future is allow the future to come into schools. So, um, I come from a tradition of uh, artificial intelligence and learning science, and briefly what that means is you're trying to figure out how people think by trying to get computers to do it, right? And so it's a testable thing. You build a computer program, you go, is it doing, does it make the same mistakes as a person? Does it make the, do the same things right and wrong? Anyways, one of the things, you, the first things you find out in that field is when you're talking about something or thinking about something, it's often helpful to think about something else instead. And the reason is, when you take it, you, you go into this other thing and you try to build an analogy, you don't bring a lot of baggage with you. You don't think you know what the answers are. You don't have the emotional attachment. So everybody here, anything anybody says about schools, you already have strong feelings about this. Oh my God, it's gotta be this way, it shouldn't be that way. But if we talk about incarceration, I'm gonna guess that most people haven't really thought about it that much, and so we, we can get a little more clarity and insight. And so I just wanna imagine for a moment that we're here to discuss the future of incarceration, okay? So somebody commits a crime, and you know, maybe it's robbery, maybe it's embezzlement, maybe he had a firearm that was half an inch too short, doesn't matter, and we sentence him to three years in prison. And the question is why, why do we do that? And really the question is not, why do we sentence him? I mean, obviously we're sentencing him because he did something wrong. Why are we sending him to prison? What is the point there? Why are we cutting the end off that roast? Okay, what is it we hope is going to happen? What goal are we trying to pursue, you know, and what technologies are we ignoring? And so you can ask questions like, so is incarceration supposed to punish the offender? And if so, why? What's the point of punishing him? What does that accomplish, right? Is it supposed to provide a deterrent? Well, if you think about the way people commit crimes, for instance, if you have a crime of passion or intoxication, by definition, you're not thinking about the future, so there's no deterrent value. And if you're a criminal and you think you're gonna get away with something, then you don't care what the penalty is because you don't expect to pay it. So incarceration as a deterrent isn't very useful. Um, is it to protect the law abiding by segregating dangerous people? If that's the case, then why would you ever do something like say, we're putting you in prison for three years? Because after three years, you're gonna be different. You will be safe from you in three years, right? Um, is it to give the, the offender time to contemplate what he did and to become a better person. There was, in fact, I know of one, it's called Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia, that was set up exactly for that purpose. And to give them credit, they designed it so that people were spending a lot of time in solitary confinement and not, you know, and they had access to some materials. That was their purpose. They're like, we want you to think about, you know, sort of like time out, right? Except it's for several years. We want you to think about what you did. Um, but most of the time, if you're trying to get people to contemplate what they did wrong, a prison is possibly the worst place that you could send them to do that. Um, are we hoping to rehabilitate them? Again, a prison, possibly the worst place you could send somebody to have them change themselves into a better person. Um, is it to provide restitution? Well, if I lock somebody up in a cage for three years, he can't possibly be doing anything to restore the property that he damaged or stole or to make any kind of atonement or reparation. And then once he gets out, then we make sure that he can never get a decent job again and he still can't, you know, he can't make anything whole. Is it to pay a debt to society? I love this term because the guy commits a crime, the guy he, he hurt doesn't get anything, we pay for his room and board for three years and somehow he's paying a debt. So anyways, my point is, we might have any of these goals in any situation, but the main obstacle that we have right now is an attitude which is one size fits all. Here's the answer, we incarcerate people and that will solve all these goals, when in fact it, it isn't a very good fit for any of these goals, okay? And if we drop that attitude, right, that one size fits all, all kinds of other solutions, that opens a space for other solutions to come forward. So for example, you think about incarceration, at one time, there was one way to know for sure where somebody was and what he was doing or not doing, and that was to put him in a cage. Because you know exactly where he is, and you know what he's doing, right? That's not the case anymore. We have better ways to know, better, cheaper ways to know where people are and what they're doing, okay? And so, 
If that is the problem we're trying to solve, then this is a particularly expensive and destructive way to do it, to put people, to house them in a cage where they're you know, subject to all kinds of horrible pressures that nobody should be subjected to. So, it's just not a good solution. And my goal here um, is not to provide a detailed analysis of incarceration. My goal is to find some insights that we can now carry back to us, with us, to a discussion of schools, okay? But if we did that full analysis, I think we would come to two conclusions, I believe. Um, the first one is, there's probably still a place for incarceration in some small, well-defined number of cases when our main goal is some kind of physical control, okay? But because of monetary and opportunity costs, it should be a last resort. It's very expensive both to, to maintain the facilities and in terms of what other people, you can't be out doing other things with the time you're spending. And in most cases, there will be some other method that is better aligned with whatever goal we're pursuing, whether that's restitution or deterrence or whatever we think we're doing. So that's the first conclusion I think we would come to if we went and talked about this for another hour, which we thankfully won't. But the second one is, if you are not clear on what problem you're actually trying to solve, then the only way you can actually solve it is by luck, right? Because you're, you're, the things you're doing have nothing to do, the, the solutions you're pursuing have nothing to do with the problem you're trying to solve, and you're not even aware of that. So you might stumble into, you might occasionally, somebody might actually rehabilitate himself. Once in a while, you know, somebody will change as a result of being in prison. But it's just luck, right? <laughs> it's not because we're doing something right. So, back to schooling. So, it turns out there are really only two institutions in society where you're not, as a rule, allowed to leave without special permission. One of them is prison, the other one's school. Um, which is kind of interesting, and viewed in this way, actually school is a form of incarceration. It's intermittent car incarceration, sort of like intermittent fasting, right? You're incarcerated for the day and then you get to leave after that. Um, Um, and so it shouldn't be a surprise, I think. It's not a surprise to me. So this is the conclusion that I just came to about incarceration, right? Um, it's not a surprise to me that uh, you should come to the same kind of conclusions about them because they're very similar in a lot of ways. Um, and so as I'll show in a moment, you know, this guy has essentially the same questions as our prisoner. Why am I here? Not why am I here. I'm here because I'm supposed to be educated so I can participate in society, but why am I here in this building at this table wasting my time, right? So just as with incarceration, where schools are concerned, we don't really have a clear idea of what our goals are. We don't literally know what we're trying to do. And so what this means is, well, the students often have a clear idea. And if you talk to the students, they, like the prisoners, their idea is, I want to get out of here. Right? They have a very clear goal. I want to get out of here as quickly as I can. And maybe good behavior will get me out. Maybe, you know, what can I do to get out of here? But that's their, their main goal. Um, and so what it means is, even when schools are successful, when you have kids who come out of a school and they go on to some great career or they're doing well on tests or whatever, it's really a matter of luck. And it has to be a matter of luck because we don't even know what target we're aiming at. So if we hit it, you know, that's, that's great, but we shouldn't expect to. And so far, we haven't been all that lucky, okay? So this is a graph from the Cato Institute, which basically shows that over several generations of students, um, through sweeping changes in pedagogy, through multiple technological revolutions, we have tripled adjusted for inflation, what we spend on students, and we've gotten no improvement at all. None, zero percent, that's, that's percentage change, nothing, okay? So, there are two former presidents of, presidents of Harvard who have uh, said essentially the same thing at two different times. And what they said is, the reason there's so much knowledge at Harvard is because the freshmen bring so much and the seniors take so little away. <laughs> okay? Now, it's a joke, but like the best jokes, there's a point there. And that is, um, let's imagine that what's going on, let's, let's just float a hypothesis here, that what's going on in the school basically is you have some kids who come in and they're already prepared because what their parents have been doing and their outside experiences, and they're gonna succeed because they don't really need you to succeed. And the other kids who are coming in, the school is essentially having no effect on them. 
This is exactly the picture you'd expect to see. If you're not seeing a change in what's coming in, who's coming in, you're not going to see a change in what's coming out if the schools aren't actually doing anything. So we have to actually, we have to seriously consider that as a hypothesis, that when schools are claiming, look at all the graduates we have who go on to great careers, it's like, yeah, they would have been if you had done nothing. You know, the null hypothesis is basically you're not accomplishing anything. We're paying a lot for it, but maybe we're not really doing anything. And my point in all of this is that the first thing we need to do before we worry about things like um, how should we do things or how should we pay for what we're going to do is figure out, let's agree on what it is we're trying to do. And until we do that, we're basically just, you know, wasting time, effort, energy, and sort of destroying some lives in the process. And this is where school boards come in. So we go to the future of school boards, which I think is a key to everything. So here's one vision of the future. Okay, the state takes over more and more of school funding, and they attach more strings to that money, more mandates, here's what you have to do, here's how you have to do it. Um, a greater attachment to what I like to call the astrology model of education, which is where you look up the kid's birthday and go, oh, you were born on this date? You should be learning the Pythagorean theorem this week. Right? So if you see that in the newspaper, you'd be laughing and just thinking, <laughs> oh, it's really funny. But when they do it in schools, everybody's like, okay, I, I guess that's how we should be doing this. So they will attach more strings to the money, more mandates, more requirements, uh, slopping things onto the curriculum. Oh, well, it's, you know, here's new things that we think are necessary. Um, and that will provide the illusion of a local control, but it will completely destroy it. Um, we'll get new taxes. And we'll spend a lot more money and, and basically keep doing what we've been doing and getting what we've been getting. And like the Red Queen, you know, this, in this model, you have to spend as fast as you can just to stay in place, right? This is Alice in Wonderland, which increasingly seems less like a children's tale and more like a prophecy. So here's the thing about being a school board member. You are, as a school board member, given conflicting orders by a number of different authorities. So one of the authorities, of course, is the state constitution. And this is what the state constitution says. In Article 83, which is the one that is, has been cited by the, Supreme, the state Supreme Court as the justification for everything that we're doing. Free and fair competition in the trades and industry is an inherent and essential right of the people and should be protected against all monopolies and conspiracies which tend to hinder or destroy it. That seems pretty straightforward, right? Um, the issue is, the state Supreme Court says exactly the opposite, that you as a school board member, your job is to help administer a monopoly that hinders or destroys free and fair competition in education. So when you're in this situation, you've got like, well, the document says that, but the person who happens to be reading it this year says that, which one should I follow? Right? And most people just brush that off, I think, and just go, well, whatever the courts say goes. Right? If, if they said this, then that's what it must mean. And even though anybody with a fifth grade education could read the original document and go, that's not what it says, we just say, okay. You know, if the court says green is blue this year, then that's fine. That's what, that's what it is. Um, but it gets better. Right? So this is what the, the state Supreme Court says in the Claremont decision about why there is a state responsibility to provide an education, right? It is to provide each educable child with an opportunity to acquire the knowledge and learning necessary to participate intelligently in the American political, economic, and social systems of free government. This is the reason for all this, right? And so if we're doing anything that can't be traced back to this reason, that's really suspect. So if we were going to agree on a goal, which we haven't, I mean, apart from the whole fact that it's 180 degrees from what the Constitution says, we could possibly agree on this goal. But there's so many loopholes here, it's, it's almost hard to know where to begin criticizing it, right? So for one thing, not yet. I'm not sure. Okay. So provide doesn't mean produce, okay? So if we want to give people heating oil, we don't set up state refineries. If we want to give people food, we don't set up state-run farms. If we want to give people health care, we don't set up state-run hospitals. We give people money, and then they go buy the things that they need. Um, why don't we do that with education? What, why is it different? So, educable child, 
That's a great word because that word is defined nowhere. Okay, it's mentioned in Claremont. It is not defined in any RSA. It's not defined in any Ed rule. It's not defined in any other court decision. Okay, so what does it mean? Who the hell knows, right? But there is some normal meaning which hasn't been you know twisted yet, which is basically you look at somebody and say some kids are not really capable of being taught certain things. Okay, and so that's an opening, it's a huge opening for actually saying, you know what, we're only going to focus on educable kids. And we're not going to worry so much about the ones who aren't. Well, maybe there's some other way to take care of them, but education is not actually what the state's responsibility is in that case. So, uh, in addition, if you have a computer and an internet connection, as I've already mentioned, you already have the opportunity to acquire any knowledge that exists, including this knowledge, right? So in that sense, all you need to do is give every kid a laptop and an internet connection, and we could cut our property taxes by a factor of 10. Okay? Why are we not doing that? Um, and if the requirement, that my favorite one is the use of the word necessary, which I think we really ought to be hammering on as a substitute for adequate. Because adequacy is sort of a judgment. This is a justification. Necessary. Here's the interesting thing. If the requirement is we have to provide the opportunity to get knowledge that's necessary to participate in government and as a citizen, then any knowledge or learning that isn't required to be mastered by everybody clearly isn't necessary. And there's no reason why the state should be paying for it, okay? Is it necessary for people to be able to read and write and understand statistical arguments in order to participate in government and as citizens? Yeah, it is. Is it necessary for people to be able to play the trombone? Not so much. Speak French? No. Get a fastball? Not really. Um, do plumbing or welding or CNC machining? Not, not so much. Okay? And so, you know, it, it raises a question which is never asked, which is why are taxpayers paying for these things? Right? It's one thing to, to pay so that people can learn to communicate clearly and understand how they're being jerked around. Right? It's quite another thing to say, yeah, oh, there's also, ne right next to the, in the Constitution, right next to that right to an education, we also find a right to job training, right? It, it's, it's not there, and I don't even think the court would say it's there if you asked them, which I'm sure somebody will. Um, and even more fun. The legislature, on the other hand, says not just that you have to provide an opportunity, it says you have to provide the actual education, right? And it doesn't mention educable children anymore. So you have to do this for all children, which is sort of like saying you guys have to suspend gravity on Fridays, right? It's not something you can do. You can't educate uneducable children by definition. And even educable children, as we all have heard, you can't, you can lead a horse to water, you can't make him drink, okay? You cannot make a kid learn if he's not interested in learning. So right now, you guys, as school, school board members, are basically getting conflicting directing, um, directives from three different authorities, the Constitution, the court, the legislature. So what are you supposed to do? Who are you supposed to listen to, okay? That's a serious question that requires some serious discussion that it's not getting currently. And we haven't even heard from the executive branch yet, right? <laughs> Who will come in and say, oh, we think it's something different. So. There are two ways to look at this. One is that this is a big problem, okay? And it looks like a problem, but maybe it's an opportunity, okay? So what do I mean by that? Here's an example of a typical RSA. We don't have to read the whole thing. Basically, it's about robbery, and it does what you would want an RSA to do. It defines a, a thing that's wrong, it defines an offense, and then it specifies a punishment. Okay, that seems pretty clear. <coughs> Compare that with this. So this is White Cane Safety Day. Every year, the governor shall take suitable public notice, blah, blah, blah. He will issue a proclamation. You know what? He didn't do it this year. And as far as I know, he didn't do it last year. And as far as I know, nobody's ever done it. And here's the thing. Did, did he get arrested? Did he have to pay a fine? Was he punished in any way? No, he was not. And that's because, if you read it, there is no consequence for not doing this. Okay. So there's a word to describe, and this is an RSA. This is not just you know some something posted on this government website like yeah this would be a good idea. This is an RSA. Somebody passed this and called it a statute, and there's a word to describe a law that has no consequences if you ignore it, and that word is suggestion. Okay, 
So, in fact, a large part of the New Hampshire RSAs are suggestions. There is no consequence that is specified for breaking those. So here's a quiz. Um, is this a law or a suggestion? I think this is a suggestion. And so the thing you have to ask yourself if you're a school board member is what if we don't do it? Do we get the same punishment as the governor? You know? Um, which is to say none at all. So what if a school board decided we're going to go four days a week or we're going to do 120 days or we're going to have school on alternate Fridays because that's really all we need for certain grades. Are the state police going to come and arrest you? There is no consequence for doing this. Frank will probably disagree a little bit, but um, to immunize against what I think he's going to want to say, he'll say, well, there are these other rules that we could bring in, but those rules have no consequence either. So you have to be able to trace it back to somebody, it's something where it says, okay, we can actually make you pay us some money or put you in jail. Um, so here's another one, which is, so is this a suggestion or a law? Okay, well this is a suggestion, but I love this one because it actually has the power within it, the, as, as uh, Jefferson might have said, it contains the seeds of dissolution for the entire school system. And that is a school board can give a diploma to anybody at any time, right? There's nothing to stop you from doing that. There's no consequence for doing that. And as soon as you give somebody a diploma, your obligation to him ends at that moment, okay? Now, there are four applications that occur to me. You may think of uh, some on your own. You got really disruptive students, students who just will not do what they're supposed to be doing and they're destroying the experience for everybody else. Here's a diploma, thanks, thanks for playing. Um, Students who are not educable, <laughs> but on whom you're spending tens or hundreds of thousand dollars. Give them a diploma, right? Advanced students, and by that I mean students who are just running out the clock. They've already learned everything they need to know to be effective citizens, and now they're like, well, I'm here, and you've got me here, and I'm trapped, so you have to give me AP courses. You have to let me go to community college, or you have to let me go get a work-study job and, and learn to be a plumber or a CNC machiner or something, right? You could give those guys diplomas. It's like, great, go ahead, go live your life. Um, and there are lots of students who actually could pass a GED, but who are prevented because they're not 16 yet. Okay, give them a test. If they pass it, it's like, that's the equivalent. Here's your diploma, go live your life, right? And make us not pay 15 or 20 or $25,000 a year to keep you housed in a place that actually prevents you from learning. So you could do this, right? This is something school boards could do. Now, suppose a school board did it, right? I haven't found one yet willing to do it. I'm working on it. Maybe some of you here could help me with this. Now suppose somebody did this and they got challenged and people came forward and said, you can't do this because those kids are not prepared. They haven't met the requirements. And you'd be like, awesome. Let's have that discussion, okay? Because as I believe Frank will probably mention, we have a graduation rate which is north of 90%, but we have a proficiency rate that's around 40%. And so can you imagine what would happen if actual penalties, fines and jail time, were being assessed to people participating in the school system for failing to educate students? The difference between 40% and 90%, that's a lot of penalties waiting to be handed out, right? And if those were being assessed, who would, who would run for school board? You'd be crazy. Who would take a job as a school administrator or possibly a teacher? You'd be out of your mind, okay? And what this tells us is, the picture is just as a if somebody did challenge us, the whole thing comes down, right? The whole system just blows up. But what this tells us is the system, whether it's by design or by accident, cannot operate with any real accountability. It can't. As soon as you stick accountability into there, the whole thing blows up, okay? We don't agree on what we're supposed to be doing, and we have no way of making anybody do it, right? And that sounds like a recipe for what? Well, pretty much what we have, right? So what we have instead, instead of actual accountability, is we have intimidation, right? So we have the courts pushing the legislature around, and we have the legislature pushing the Department of Education around, and we have the Department of Education pushing school boards around, school boards pushing administrators around, although that often happens in the other direction. We have administrators pushing teachers around, we have teachers pushing students around, we have students pushing each other around. It's just bullying all the way down, right? 
So what is the official advice on handling bullying? Well, we actually, Jody and I were look, trying to look at anti-bullying policies all around the state, and most of them just amount to, if you reduce them to what they say, it's like, we're against it. Okay, that, that's the official anti-bullying policy. We, we don't like it. Um, but the government, particularly the federal government, the health and System of Health and Human Services Department, they actually give some advice on their website, right? That when you have bullying, if adults, <laughs> so we have to find some adults, that's require one, requirement one. When adults respond quickly and consistently to bullying behavior, they send the message that it is not acceptable. And research shows that this can stop bullying behavior over time. So what, you know, basically stop letting them get away with it. That's how you handle bullies. That's the, that's the official US government advice on how to handle bullies. Just, you know, don't let them get away with it. Good luck with that. <laughs> but my point here is that in a nutshell, to reduce all this to like one sentence, if a school is going to have um, a future that looks different from its past, this is what it's gonna look like, right? That you got the big state behemoth and you've got David and David wins. Um, and that's what it's, if it doesn't look like this, then as I said, we get the other future where we just keep shoveling money in faster and faster. So I'm gonna say a few words about the future of teaching, right? So we live in an ocean of high quality, easily accessible pedagogical resources. In fact, it's getting harder and harder to get away from that. The only two places you can go where you don't have those are you go way out in the woods someplace or you go into a school. Those are the only places you can actually get away from all these resources. So we have to ask the question, again, think about why are we cutting the roast off, at the end of the roast off, right? What exactly do we need classroom teachers for? And I'm not asking this frivolously, but it can't be to deliver material, to stand in front of a class and tell them things, because we, technology allows us access to people who can do it a lot better than the people who happen to live in our town and teach that subject, right? If I, if, even if I could go to my local school and take a chemistry class, I wouldn't do it. I'd go to the teaching company, or I'd go to MIT, or Yale, or, or Harvard, and I'd look at their online courses and do their online work. work. I would, the chances that the guy in my school system is gonna do a better job than that are vanishingly small and getting smaller every year. So that can't be it. And it can't really be about assessment because in most cases, teachers are using technology for assessment and the technology is getting better at it because it can be more responsive and know more things. So there are lots of things. You go to learn them online. If I wanna to go to learn programming, I can go to a course, they'll have lessons, I do the lessons, and I can actually write programs and see. The, the system will tell me, yeah, you did something wrong, you got this result, you were trying to do this, this is what happened instead. So it can't be for any of those two things, but I think we do need them for two things. The first one is motivation. Okay, so this is, a, this is Abe Lincoln over here with his, this is just the version one eye shovel, so it has no network connectivity, um, and you couldn't really put many apps on it. And so what he had to do to learn to teach himself reading and writing was take coals out of his fireplace and write on the shovel and practice his letters, and he would have to walk a mile, two miles, three miles to his neighbor's house to borrow books. On the right side, we got a kid who might be, you know, say, oh, from Sunapee, right? And he just doesn't care. And it doesn't matter how much technology you put in front of him. It doesn't matter, right? So here are two questions on the bottom that almost nobody ever asks because we're so obsessed with money and we're so focused on money, nobody ever stops. If you want to learn something, especially now, I mean, this guy, this is like in the 1800s. Now, if you want to learn something, can somebody stop you? They can't, right? And if you don't want to learn something, can anybody make you? So we can turn that into a second question. How much money do you have to spend to teach somebody something if they don't want to learn it? As we saw in the graph, there ain't enough. We could spend all of it, and it's not gonna matter, okay? So the thing about technology in particular is it's a tremendous aid. If you know what you wanna learn and why you wanna learn it, it makes things easier, faster, quicker. It provides you with access to so much more. If you don't know what you're trying to do and you don't know why you're trying to do it, apart from just, I need, God, I need to get out of here, um, there's research that shows it actually gets in the way. So we're trying to help, but we don't know what we're trying to do, and we don't know why we're doing it, so we're actually making things worse. Um, I believe Frank is gonna show a film later by a company named Two Revolutions. It's a very nice film, and it talks about what we would need to do to fix education, and watch it carefully. Unless I missed something, I blinked maybe, 
I don't believe motivation is actually addressed in there at all. They're talking about if we create this environment, if we build it, they will learn. But then if they don't know why they're learning, <laughs> or, or they don't have a reason of what they, they want to learn, what they want to learn, not what we want them to learn, what they want to learn, then it's not clear that's going to solve anything. So I think these are the teachers of the future. Tony Robbins, Zig Ziglar, Les Brown, Oprah, Brian Tracy, right? Because what we need from a, from a teacher that a, a computer can't do yet is we need somebody who can listen to a student and who can understand what that student's problems are and what they're thinking and what they want and what their confusions are and somebody who can inspire a student to say this is who you are, this is what you want, these now are some ways that you can go get it, there you go, right? And there will be people, that, and the world is full of people who will help you, right? To paraphrase Yates, um, uh, kids do not need pedagogy and content experts to fill their pails. They need motivators to light their fires. And that's what's missing from schools. So there's still a big job there for teachers. Uh, unfortunately, it's probably not something you need full time. And it doesn't really need to happen in a classroom. But that leads to the second thing, which is usually called classroom management, but which is really not to put your finer point on a daycare, okay? Um, and so I want to close today by imagining a future in which uh, somebody like Andrew Vilinsky goes back to the state Supreme Court and convinces them that they can discover um, that parents have a right to daycare and that it's the state's responsibility to pay for that. Now, you may be laughing and thinking, <laughs> that's ridiculous, but is it? Given what they've done in the past, it's completely within the scope of things that might happen, right? So let's say that in response to this, every town is required to set up a safe, quiet space with internet access where parents can park their kids while they go out and do their jobs, right? And where the kids can spend that time learning what they want to learn, starting when they want to start, proceeding at their pace, until they can demonstrate whatever level of competence we think is required for them to participate as citizens, right? And then they're done. And then now, Basically, here's your, here's your citizenship certificate. Go forth and contribute, right? That actually would be a straightforward, literal implementation of what the Supreme Court insists we ought to be doing. We would be providing each educable child with an opportunity to acquire the knowledge and learning necessary to participate intelligently in the American political, economic, and social systems of free government. We would be doing that directly rather than going indirectly and saying, well, we hope that if we spend a ton of money and build an auditorium and a swimming pool, and maybe if we make them sit in a chair for a thousand hours a year for 12 years, that they'll come out educated at the end, which I think experience has shown really doesn't work. And so here's my question. If we had this, if we had daycare, connected daycare, and you threw in some ex motivational experts on call. So if you got a kid who's bored and he's like, God, I, I don't even know what I should be doing. Great, let's talk to Tony Robbins, okay? And he will get you fired up, and you'll be coming back saying, okay, I need these materials, and here's where I'm trying to go, right? Suppose you had that. Well, here's the question. What would schools add to that? I actually think the answer is nothing. And if the answer is nothing, then maybe this should be the future for schools. But, of course, there's a problem. Not everybody is going to be on board with this, right? Um, but you, why wait? Why wait for the court case? Why not do it now? And if you think it's too big a change, why not do it with an experiment? Take some kids and say, we're gonna try something different with you. And we're gonna give you this kind of space and we'll give you a little bit of guidance and we'll see what happens, right? You don't have to do it for everybody. You don't have to make the switch all at once. And it, this would be better for the kids. It would be fairer to taxpayers because you'd actually be really clear about what you're doing and why you're doing it. And they would have a chance to say, yeah, okay, you know what? We can get on board with this. And the only thing standing between this and a school board is a bunch of bullies. So, you know, Gandhi didn't put up with that. Maybe you don't have to either. So, I have two take-home messages, really. The first one is, it's really important not to confuse methods with goals. It's really easy to get tied up and say, well, if I follow these things or I do this activity, it will take me where I want to go. And in fact, it may not. Maybe it can't even possibly do it, right? And so the way I think of this is if your goal is to get kids to the moon, then it's not helpful for you to worry about which, state, which trees the state says they should be climbing because it's not going to get them there, okay? 
And the second take home message is that once you're clear on your goals, and once you know what those are and you're willing to go directly towards them, you have more power and more freedom, more real local control than you think. Because the state cannot come down on you without killing itself. So that's what I have to say. I hope that was helpful. Thanks. Yeah. Karen. So Ann, thank you very much. I think you're you're right on task as far as inspiring children to learn. However, what I think we're missing in all of this, because you see the proficiency at the end of third grade as an improvement to the end eleventh grade, is that until a child learns to decode their word world and be able to manipulate the um, financial side of things. They can't unlock this world and can't be inspired because they can't read anything. Well, right, and so before they so can that read... that has to be the, the fundamental purpose of what we do as educators. Sure, I, and I agree with you, but I, that's one of the things. Then early, you know, early on, you're trying to help kids understand why are we doing this? There, this we're not just doing not this just to torture you. Anything. Well, but sort of if the thing is, if you can't put the letter B with the sound B to be able to take that uh, butter and decode it. You can't unlock your world, is my point. Right. And if we're not teaching children systematic phonics, they're not learning to do that, which is why our proficiency doesn't improve by the time they get to 11th right. grade. Right, somebody uh, I worked with at NASA once said we're agreeing violently here. Um, what I'm saying, though, is that if the kid isn't learning to read and doesn't seem to know why he should learn to read because people will read things to him and people will just tell him stuff, okay, what's his motivation? So little kids can be motivated. I think everybody who has little kids knows that they can be motivated to do things, and sometimes the motivation is indirect and it just gets them going. But motivation is still key. It doesn't matter how old the kid is. If he's old enough to have a conversation with you. He's old enough to actually have you be motivating him. And look, this is the thing you have to... The, the kids I mentioned in Nashville, their parents actually did something that we thought was very interesting. They had a book about how to read and it had a particular system which is actually pretty cool. But their thing was, when you get to the end of this book, you can have anything you want. Now, it's interesting that the kids never asked for something like, I want a swimming pool. It was always like, I want a bike. Or could we go to Funland? Or whatever, right? Because they were young enough that their imagination for what they could get wasn't there. But it was an incredible motivation. It was like, I get whatever I want when I get to the end of it. They couldn't wait to get to that. So even at those ages, you know, four, five, six years old, you can motivate kids to learn what is going to be good for them. And jumping off that and, and notching up a step, there's so much incorrect information. I think it's great to give these kids the laptop and let them have at it, but who's going to be the... Um, who, yeah, who's going to discuss that with them and make sure that they're getting the correct information? Sure, you would hope that parents would do that, but that's not a full-time content presentation job. That's a sitting down with the kid and helping them find, oh, maybe ABC Mouse works for you. Maybe this game works for you. I talked to somebody, somebody mentioned a, a talk I gave that was similar to this, that they had a kid who wasn't learning to read until he ended up going out and making letters in the snow with the other end of a shovel. And it was like, that's what it took, okay? Whatever it's gonna take, that's what it takes, and for every kid it's different. But the point is, there is all this information, there are all these, these programs, there's materials. The world is full of them. And so the job then becomes, one, helping them know why they should be doing this, and two, helping them find the right path to get started, right? There is no one path. I, I think that what you said, it's, it's we need to somehow be teaching parents in our, in our public education schools. We need to have classes for parents to know, to know how to teach their kids. We can, because teachers aren't handing that over, aren't letting know. And it's like just giving them the grades that their kids are getting is not, I still say our communities need to be teaching parents. I mean, I'm not certainly against, I'm certainly not against that, and I would note that if you look at any of the things, it doesn't actually say that the, the people who have to be educated to become citizens are kids. 
It just says, people, if you haven't learned some of that stuff, you're still a people. And I don't mean to cut off these questions. I would like them to continue in the third hour. And we'll let Frank address them as well, because I know he wants to. Um, take a 10 minute break, and then we'll come back. Thank you. And um, don't forget to fill out your satisfaction surveys. Everybody should have received one. And write down your questions, okay? Especially at this deeper level. Cook TV.